This is designed in, as the, there's three components. There's the sculptural installation, um, what was designed as a two channel audio, but is experienced as one channel in the headphones, um, and a text artwork. Um, and they all kind of relate to one another and um, intermingle amongst themselves, like as you're trying to experience it visually and auditorily and, you know, through language. Um, and about me, I'm uh, mostly a sculptor and I wasn't making sculpture when I was here, I was painting. Um, and then I quit making art for a while, for about three or four years, and I moved to New York. Um, and then I started making art again. And shortly thereafter, went to grad school and um, went to a very conceptual grad school. Um, and so my practice is strange in that it's very materially based and a lot of my subject matter directly addresses spatial politics and um, objecthood, but um, it's also very, uh, very broad and conceptual. Um, and I'm interested more in um, looking at trends in society or looking at uh, thought frameworks that we apply to how we view society than I am um, specific issues. Because I think that um, ultimately like art has the potential to present new like epistemological frameworks through which we can look at society and move it forward. And I think right now, like a big problem is that um, we're struggling to find solutions to what seem like impossible problems um, from all angles and perspectives. And that um, what I'm really trying to do with this series of work is sort of uh, to sort of create experiences that border, you know, that take you to the very edge of sense making almost. Um, to where the mind sort of has to venture into like psychedelic imagination, um, which I think can can spur some of these new ways of thinking or looking at um, the world when we experience it outside of an art context. Um, so this piece is called Escape Route Module Number Ten. Um, about three years ago, I maybe four years ago, five years ago. I started working with um, the abstracting from crowd control barriers, which are, you know, we've been to New York, they're all over the streets, they're um, used at concerts, um, but ultimately like the object's identity is rooted in its function as something that prevents the movement of bodies through space. Um, and essentially what I've been doing with these various configurations is building escape routes into them. So like redesigning them architecturally so that my body can like move through the space and in doing so like challenge like what even is this object if we know what it is because of its function if I take away its functionality then what is it it becomes a new thing it becomes art for one um, this piece is special because um, it's the first time I've broken a sculpture so it was made as one and then, um, then I, I have, it, there's a video piece that accompanies it, it's about 30 minutes though, of me basically hacking it into three parts. Um, so it's imagined from two interlocking uh, crowd control barriers that sort of resemble rib cages almost. Um, and then instead of, uh, designing in by removing bars or other strategies I've used in other configurations. In this one, I just broke the sculpture um, as like the way out. Um, and the audio that accompanies this, well, and, it, and it's sitting on a set. And so that's, that's something that I've been working with a lot lately, um, are these concepts of these like sets as a sculpture itself. Um, and I think that I'm doing that in part to emphasize, uh, I want these to be looked at as, I want you to be imagining interacting with the work, but not being allowed to actually interact with the work physically. Um, and the sound piece,
half of it, one channel of it is um, this really bizarre um, set of stage directions that um, these two voices are telling you how to get from the inside of the barrier to the outside without touching the barrier um, in very like detailed form. Um, and I was really, I've been reading a lot of Beckett lately and revisiting that, um, sort of like, more like the Gothic side of modernism. Um, and I actually took a class on modern drama at Davidson and that's where my love of modern drama started. But, um, and he, he did a bunch of plays later in his career that have um, no actual words. It's just stage directions and set directions. Um, so I sort of like applying like an inverse of that idea to this because the body's not allowed to physically be in the space and interact with it. You can only watch. So it, it's, um, it made sense to me to sort of invert that. Whereas he's doing it with theater where like it's a performance that's meant to be watched. But I think that like at least the history of sculpture in the last like, you know, 50, 60 years, like generally speaking, like people would expect to be able to move on um, like around this piece, like sort of a Richard Serra approach, um, especially for works that are addressing like spatial politics. Um, uh, a lot of people ask why I use pearls. Um, uh, my research on pearls started about five or six years ago too. Um, I grew up in Atlanta and I think at first it was you know, I had a grandfather who had was really old when he had my mom, and so he fought in World War II, and he had these pearls that he found in the South Pacific, and they were made into earrings for me um, on my 16th birthday, and I wore them every day, and I actually lost, until I lost them, and I lost them at Davidson. Um, uh, but uh, I'm very, I, just this idea of these, um, you know, the, this piece of jewelry that, in the South, but also, you know, I have friends that grew up in Hong Kong that say it has the same, you know, cultural symbolism there as well of, um, you know, a way of marking the body is value. So marking class and gender um, expectations or positionality um, in a very like literal way on the body. And so then, you know, some of the research around the pearls has taken me into um, it's history in the Americas, which, um, you know, it, uh, the pearl farming operations in the Americas started like before any other, before the sugar cane plantations in the Caribbean or any of that. It was actually during the Baroque, early Baroque period, I guess, um, in the first like 10 or 15 years of colonization and um, skilled workers were taken from, you know, other parts of the world and forced to labor in pearl lighting. Um, operations in the Caribbean and off the coast of uh, Colombia and Brazil. Um, and at that time in the world, like the pearl had more um, exchange value than almost any other object like possible, higher than gold, any of that. And so um, they were, you know, the seed capital that was gathered from those operations was actually like, you know, what enriched Spain and some of the other countries in Europe and then allowed them to have the capital to then start, you know, the plantation industrial complexes in the Caribbean, which then provided the capital for the United States. And so I think it, you know, it has a direct relationship to the history of the South and the history of the United States from like multiple angles. Um, and yeah, does it, I think it's, it, there's a lot here. It's sort of like, uh, my installation works are basically my whole practice. So if anybody has any questions, like I'm happy to answer or just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs>